Today, we will learn and reflect on the history and the teachings of the Council of Trent. Most history books paint the Council of Trent as a reactionary council that sparked the Counter-Reformation in Catholicism. While everyone agrees that Trent was convened in response to the Protestant Reformation where Martin Luther challenged many of the teachings of the Catholic Church, modern scholarship paints Trent in a more positive light as a reforming council in its own right. The Trent was the council that was the true foundation of the succeeding Vatican II Council many centuries later. You could even say the Trent was spiritually the true Vatican I Council. You may ask, how will studying the history of the Council of Trent improve my soul? The Catholic teachings affirmed by the Council of Trent are quoted extensively in the Catholic Catechism, which is itself a restatement of the decrees of Vatican II. And the decrees of Trent form the heart of the theology of the Vatican II Council. In my humble opinion, you really cannot truly understand Catholicism and indeed the Western tradition unless you read St. Augustine's Confessions and John O'Malley's recent histories of Vatican II and the Council of Trent, which is our primary source for this video and blog. These two histories stress the continuity between the Councils of Trent and Vatican II. At the end of our talk, we will discuss the sources used for this video, which are primarily O'Malley's book and lectures on Trent. Please, we welcome interesting questions in the comments. Sometimes these generate short videos of their own. Let us learn and reflect together. To date, there have been 21 ecumenical councils. The first seven ecumenical councils were sponsored by Emperor Constantine and later emperors in, in or near Constantinople in the East. These are recognized by both the Catholic and the Orthodox churches today. Uh, the next 14 ecumenical councils were held in the West under the authority of the Pope and are only recognized by the Catholic Church. The Council of Trent was the 19th ecumenical council. All ecumenical councils prior to Vatican II only dealt with issues the church was currently facing. The first seven ecumenical councils dealt with cornerstone issues like the nature of the Trinity and how Jesus could simultaneously be both fully human and fully divine. Reviewing the calendar of Council of Trent, it was called in response to the challenges posed by Martin Luther. Since Luther challenged the entire sacramental system of the Catholic Church, plus challenges to Catholic doctrines including purgatory, original sin, and justification, the decrees of the Council of Trent were more comprehensive than any of the previous councils. Now in 1517 was when Luther posted his 95 Theses on the church door in Wittenberg, which started the Protestant Reformation. Luther was never conciliatory. He was always brutally polemic. The printing press had just been invented and many printers distributed leaflets like this one in the illustration that pictures the demons on the side of the Pope. To illustrate how argumentative and how confrontational Luther could be, this is an example from the 95 Theses and you see in this sections of the theses, he's talking about indulgences. And let's look at an indulgence 75 in particular. This is how Luther writes. And he says, to consider papal indulgences so great that they could absolve a man, even if he had done the impossible and had violated the mother of God, is madness. Now, what possessed Luther to say something like this about the Pope? Wasn't Luther totally mad? Just try to imagine what the response from the crowd would have been when his 75th thesis was read aloud in the taverns across Germany. Luther would say stuff like this all the time. He could go for pages and pages of brilliant theology and then stop and start calling the Pope names like the Whore of Babylon and sometimes even worse. And we have from 1550 to 1523, we have the starts of the discussions on calling a church council, perhaps to reconcile with the Protestants to prevent a church split, but it was not until over 20 years later in 1545 that the Council of Trent was finally called by Pope Paul III. Now why the delay? By this time the second generation 
the Protestant leaders were coming on the scene. Calvinism was on the rise, and the Protestant doctrinal positions had been set in concrete. Luther himself died in 1546, soon after the council itself convened. Another reason for the delay? Prior popes distrusted councils. One of the prior councils, the Council of Basel, had been a rogue council that was disowned by nearly everyone. And also, to call a council, the Pope needed the support of the two leading monarchs of Europe, King Francis of France and Charles V, the Habsburg monarch, who was both King of Spain and Holy Roman Emperor. Now, during the interim, also, Charles V had gone to war against the small Catholic League of German Lutheran princes, and the idea was, if he won, there'd be no need for a council. He could just force them to readopt Catholicism. Now, also, Charles V had invaded Italy, and in Italy, his mercenary armies didn't get paid as quick as they wanted to, so they went out, got out of control and sacked Rome in 1527, and this irritated Pope Clement because he was forced to flee for his life, and he spent several years in exile outside of Rome. His successor, Pope Paul III, before he was elected Pope, was the typical worldly cardinal that Luther and the Protestants so loudly condemned. He enjoyed the perks of his office and openly lived with his mistress who bore him several children. Some gossips at the time called him Cardinal Cunt. But as Bishop of Parma, he underwent a religious conversion, put away his mistress, reformed his diocese, and when he was elected Pope, he pushed for calling a reformed church council. History permits us to give the benefit of the doubt both to Emperor Charles V and King Francis to argue. Like Pope Paul III, these two monarchs were also genuinely concerned about reforming the church. Although out of necessity, politics always played a part. Pope Paul III had to gain assent from the Catholic monarchs of Europe before calling a council. There was no separation of church and state in this era of history. Not only was the monarch the political head of the churches in their realms, but the bishops and cardinals in their realm also assisted the monarchs in running the state. And in 1545, finally, the Council of Trent was called. Emperor Charles V insisted that the council be held in German lands because he wanted to exert influence over the council. But Pope Paul III wanted the council to be near Rome so he could exert influence over the council. Although Trent was on the Italian side of the Alps, it was in German land, so although it was a small town at the time, it was the ideal compromise location for the church council. None of these three leaders would live to see the end of the Council of Trent, although they did not know that at the time. When travel was by horseback and the roads were bad, convening international meetings could be challenging. For example, in American history, the early arrivals to the Constitutional Convention had to wait several months until enough people arrived to form a quorum. Trent suffered the same problem. On this day, the council was scheduled to start. Fewer than 40 attendees had arrived. Now, when the delegates arrived, they discovered not only had there not been any preparation for the council, there was no set agenda. Trent was like Vatican II. Many leading theologians attended, and not only did they advise the bishops and cardinals, but they also held classes on the theological reform issues facing the council. When calling the council, Pope Paul III did emphasize that the council decree should not criticize individuals, Luther included, but should only criticize incorrect doctrine. Now to modern ears, the formal decrees of Trent sound confrontational because they are always framed in the negative. Anathemas were declared against anyone who dis disagreed with church doctrine. Now this had been the case uh, since the early councils of the time of Emperor Justinian. These confrontational anathemas were issued by most church councils since that time. The biggest reform of Vatican II was to adopt a pastoral approach and drop these confrontational anathemas. So, the first item in the agenda at Trent was the agenda. The Pope and his delegates thought that doctrine was the problem and that doctrine should come before reform, while the monarchs thought that reforms should go before doctrine. As a compromise, the delegates decided they would mix it up and take a doctrinal issue and then address a reform issue. 
The Pope was upset at this compromise, but his papal delegates who chaired the council were able to convince him that this compromise was necessary. Though the council delegates respected the authority of the Pope, this helped set the tone of the council. They were serious about the council, and they did not see their role as simply rubber stamping papal decrees. The most important reform issue addressed was the issue of whether the bishops should reside in their diocese, which meant that they could only hold one bishopric. This was a problem because many bishops got rich and did not do anything to help support the diocese. They just collected the rent, so to speak. Now this had always been the rule, but the problem was that the prior popes were quick to grant dispensations for this rule. And worse, the papacies depended on the fees charged for dispensations from requirements like this. So the debate was, should this be a matter of divine law? This meant that papal dispensations were not possible. Now, this was quite a hot topic, obviously, because there were quite a few bishops that had multiple bishoprics and were getting quite wealthy off of this. And so this was politically a very difficult thing to do, so the delegates decided not to pursue this particular issue. On doctrinal issues, the actual decisions of the Council of Trent were often not as confrontational as the official decrees of the Council and the post-conciliar Catholic interpretations and history of the Council would imply. One of the issues was the canon, in particular the canon of the Old Testament. Although the early church, by consensus, had set the canon of the New Testament, there had never been a need to formally set the canon of the Old Testament. The church fathers differed on which book should be included in the Old Testament canon. St. Jerome, who had updated the Latin translation of scriptures and the Vulgate, preferred a narrow canon, including only the Hebrew books of the Jewish canon. St. Augustine preferred the wider canon, which included the deuterocanonical books written in Greek, which are also called the Apocrypha by Protestants. Luther preferred to exclude the deuterocanonical books and several are problematic according to his slogan sola scriptura or scripture alone tobit and judith are both clearly fictional and not historical and maccabees exhorts us to pray for the dead which catholics claim as support for the doctrine of purgatory which luther rejected now the delegates at Trent really did not want to decide for, between the positions of St. Jerome and St. Augustine, so the official decree simply lists the books of the wider canon, which meant that Trent, by default, adopted the position of St. Augustine. There was no debate at the Council that the Vulgate Latin translation was problematic and needed updating to reflect current scholarship and recently discovered ancient manuscripts. Likewise, the Trent delegates did not intend to discourage vernacular translations of the Bible. The delegates simply said that the Vulgate was an okay translation. Likewise, the delegates at Trent did not spend a great deal of time distinguishing between scriptures and tradition, and which comes first. Any debate on this topic has to address the fact that the New Testament canon was not set until the 5th century. And to keep this in perspective, the Protestant Reformation itself was five centuries ago from today. And this is all the Trent decrees say about traditions. The Council clearly perceives that this truth and rule are contained in the written books and unwritten traditions that have come down to us, having been received by the Apostles by the mouth of Christ himself, or from the Apostles by the dictation of the Holy Spirit and have been transmitted, as it were, from hand to hand. Luther also challenged the Catholic doctrines on original sin and justification by faith, which are also closely related to the question of free will. O'Malley in his book says that while Luther was the expert in slogans and sound bites, the Catholic theologians were expert in scholarly formulation of doctrines, and indeed, pages and pages of the official decrees of Trent dealt with these issues. To put it in a nutshell, the Catholic Church and the Council of Orange many centuries before had rejected the radical Augustinian notion of total predestination, insisting that though Christians need God's grace to be justified by faith, there is always a degree of free will, 
that we as individual Christians must cooperate with the Holy Spirit to be justified by faith. Now, I'm not going to get too deeply into the discussions uh, about free will and justification by faith and original sin because it can be very technical. But I do want to read a discussion by Jaroslav Pelikan in his history of the Christian doctrine. And I've seen this discussion repeated by several other theologians over many years. And he argues, and many other theologians argue, that a mistranslation of a key verse in Romans may have led to an incorrect understanding of original sin by St. Augustine. And this is a little technical, so bear with me. In the sin of Adam, the entire human race sinned, in St. Augustine's Latin Bible, and put this in perspective, St. Augustine was using a corrupted translation that was prior to St. Jerome's translation of the Vulgate. So in St. Augustine's substandard Latin translation, Romans 5.12 read this, Sin came into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, through one man, in whom all men sinned. Although this last clause in the Greek really meant because all men sinned, the translation in whom all men sinned had led earlier Western theologians to, to conclude that all have sinned in Adam, for he himself was corrupted by sin, and all whom Adam begot were born under sin. Quoting these words, Augustine insisted that all men are understood to have sinned in that first man, because all men were in him when he sinned, and that is not the modern understanding of this translation. And the Romans 5.12 is translated entirely differently today. During this time, Pope Paul III also approved the formation of the Jesuit order by St. Ignatius Loyola in 1540. Later, the Jesuits would be instrumental in implementing many of the reforms of Trent, including the establishment of schools and seminaries and hospitals and sending missionaries all across Europe and the globe. We have another blog and we'll soon cut a video on the story of the Jesuits based also on a book and lectures by John O'Malley. The Council of Trent reaffirmed that there were indeed seven sacraments rather than the two sacraments affirmed by Luther, baptism in the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper. As an aside, Luther was considering making a third sacrament, uh, making penance a third sacrament, and he decided against it. None of the ancient church fathers referred to a list of seven sacraments. Scriptures say that we should strive for perfection, but scripture does not mention sacraments. So if we could ask the ancient church fathers to list the sacraments, they would likely respond that our entire lives should be sacramental. So the list of seven sacraments were first listed in the medieval church and this list was adopted more or less organically by the Orthodox Church with some small changes. The delegates in the first session rather quickly discussed baptism and confirmation and they confirmed that confirmation was beneficial because the more radical Anabaptists were gaining members, the council was also eager to affirm that infant baptism was proper although this was not an issue with the Lutherans. Now real progress was being made and the delegates fully expected that all topics would be covered without having to adjourn, but then nearby somebody fell deathly ill and the doctors were concerned. Maybe this was the plague. But anyway, in the day, any, any mention of plague just struck dread into everybody. The delegates decided to adjourn the council and the Papal delegates tried to reconvene the council at Bologna, which was closer to Rome. Charles V refused to send his delegates to an Italian city, and after two years of waiting, the Pope finally released the delegates. So there was nothing happening at Bologna other than a bunch of talk and a bunch of waiting. And politics interfered again. Pope Paul III's son was assassinated. The Pope and many historians suspect that Charles V was responsible. So, soon Pope Paul III passes away, and the next Pope, Julius III, decides to reconvene the council. And the council is reconvened a few years later in 1551, in the second session. And they continued the discussions on the seven sacraments. 
they talked about the Eucharist and they reaffirmed that yes the Eucharist was the real presence of Christ and the delegates decided that transubstantiation rather than the Lutheran formulation of consubstantiation and an oversimplification of the Lutheran understanding of consubstantiation is that it's transubstantiation with the Aristotelian elements stripped out. The adoration of the Eucharist was reaffirmed. There were many popular festivals that surrounded the adoration, so they definitely wanted to retain it. And they reaffirmed the sacraments of penance and last rites. And again, politics interfered. They were going good. They had just gotten started, but then Protestant armies in the ongoing war with Charles V were coming close to Trent, so they adjourned the council once more. And it was close to a decade later until it was reconvened. And you say, well, why did it take so long to reconvene the council? Well, O'Malley has several chapters and I think several lectures on this interim period, but we'll kind of like sum it up. And after the second session, politics heated up. France declared war on Charles V. France allied with the Lutheran Protestants. Charles V lost the war. He had health problems. And then he abdicated. And then he decided the Habsburg domains were just too big for one person to effectively rule, so he split them in two. The Pope died. The next reactionary Pope caused problems, and then he died, which meant that the Council of Trent was suspended uh, for a decade before it was reconvened by Pope Pius IV. So, what a busy decade. The next generation of monarchs were the Holy Roman em Emperor Ferdinand, King Philip II of Spain, and King Francis II of Spain. Now Francis was a child at the time, so the true power was exercised by the Guise family who acted as regents. This included Charles de Guise, who played an important role in the third session of Trent. Another important personality was the papal delegate, Cardinal Moroni, and we encourage you to read Mr. O'Malley's books and listen to his lectures for some entertaining stories about Cardinal Moroni. He probably would have been elected Pope himself later had he not crossed swords with the richest cardinal at the time, who held several bishoprics, and who was the grandson of Pope Paul III. And you say, well, how can that be? Well, although Pope Paul III was a reforming pope, he had a weak spot for his family, and he granted dispensations so his grandson could accumulate multiple wealthy bishoprics. Oh, how ironic. The first decision that had to be made by the delegates of the third session, since this was such a long time since the prior sessions had been convened, was whether or not this would be a new council or a continuation of the Council of Trent. And the delegates decided that this would be a continuation. Protestants were invited to speak at this third session and they did speak at an informal session, but nothing came of this. These were now second generation Protestants. They were not gonna compromise with Rome. Not only did they not wanna recognize the legitimacy of the council, the Pope was angry that the Protestants were allowed to speak at all. And there was not all that many controversial topics left at the third session. The big issue surrounding the sacrament of marriage was not so much a Lutheran issue, but just a, a problem in general. According to custom dating back to Greece and Rome, marriage was seen as a sacrament between a man and a wife, and ceremonies took place at the home. Although the priest might be asked to bless the home and later the couple. This was a major problem in Europe. Young couples would elope, and after sh pregnancy, the guy would claim, hey, we didn't exchange any vows. So the change in reform at Trent was that marriages were not valid unless vows were exchanged before priests and the church. And this change was quietly adopted by the Protestants as well, because all Protestants that I know of marry in church. And also another issue that was not a new issue, and they wanted to reaffirm that kidnapping was not a valid form of courtship. And this goes back to the founding myths of Rome, where the Roman men kidnapped the women of a nearby tribe so they can marry them, as you can see in this painting of the rape of the Sabine women. And the custom never entirely died out. And this issue had been condemned in several preceding ancient and medieval church councils. But Trent repeated this condemnation saying that kidnapping is not an acceptable form of courtship. 
and they went through the sacraments uh, some more and some of the issues they discussed was uh, clerical celibacy and holy orders which is ordination was also one of the sacraments uh, the Lutherans had permitted their priests to marry and there's no biblical prohibition against priests marrying and some of the apostles were married there is discussion of the issue of clerical celibacy but the delegates preferred that the Pope would address this thorny issue the delegates discussed holy orders and confirmed that ordination is indeed a sacrament also in the reform of the bishops they decided that bishops must tend to their flocks bishops must regularly visit the churches and schools and hospitals in their diocese and must regularly deliver homilies and prospective bishops must show that they can fulfill these duties you might ask wasn't this reform of the bishops accomplished in the first session well yes kind of but it wasn't very effective because the problem is it's easy to enforce this rule for future bishops but for current bishops you're just not going to be able to enforce it because they're very rich and they're very powerful so this reform of Trent was very effective as the decades and centuries went on future bishops were expected to fulfill their duties as pastors of their diocese steps were also taken to improve education for the priests at the diocese level initially funding was an issue but over the centuries the education improved assisted by the efforts of the Jesuits the nuns were required to live a cloistered life at the time several orders were not cloistered now if you remember the history of St. Francis he had insisted that the ladies of Clare would be cloistered that is because the ancient and medieval worlds were dangerous places for women and the council delegates also discussed the rituals of the mass and Trent says this since humanity cannot easily raise itself up with the meditation of divine realities without external aids, the Mother Church has duly established certain rites, such as reading some portions of the Mass in a quieter tone and others in a louder tone, and it has provided ceremonies such as symbolic blessings, light, incense, vestments, and many other rituals from apostolic order and tradition by which the majesty of the great sacrifice is enhanced and the minds of the faithful are aroused by these visible signs of religious devotion to contemplation of the high mysteries hidden in the Mass. And much was accomplished at Trent in the third session in November 1562 were the final days. There was just a few issues they had to address. They figured, well, we'll address them in a couple of weeks' time and then we'll wrap it up and, and go home. But then they heard that Pope Pius IV was on his deathbed, and if he had died before the council was adjourned, there would be another long interruption of the council. So, in quick order, these decrees were drawn up in a few days with little or no discussion on purgatory, indulgences, fasting, the missal and the breviary. It is so odd to think that there's been so much debate on these topics in succeeding centuries and people assumed that a great deal of thought had been placed into these and I they, these weren't controversial topics so I don't think that there would have been much changes but the fact was is there was no or very little debate also the issue of the index of forbidden books which is an issue that was placed before the council they referred that back to the Pope and Pope Pius IV died shortly after the council was adjourned on December 9th 1565 John O'Malley makes a strong argument that Trent is a forward-looking reforming council and that the history of Vatican II, he will also strongly argue that the decrees of Vatican II largely adapted the theological decrees of Trent, which you can see from the documents themselves. They thoroughly footnote the Council of Trent. So you may ask the question, why does the Council of Trent have the reputation of a backward-looking reactionary council? Well, there was a polemic war being waged between the Catholics and the Protestants. The new Pope, Pius V, closed the archives of the Trent Council debate so Protestants couldn't cherry-pick through them to attack the heritage of the Council. And the Pope formed a reactionary congregation of Council to interpret the decrees of Trent. And he didn't allow anyone other than devout, totally devout Catholics that he totally trusted to write histories of the Council of Trent.
This very conservative implementation included insisting on the use of the Latin Vulgate Bible, although eventually there was a new translation, and on the Latin Mass, and tried to prevent laymen from reading the Bible on their own. The laity was denied the cup during the administration of the Eucharist. At this time, Catholics and Lutherans were very concerned about establishing their separate identity, each claiming to be the one true church. On the positive side, the Trent Catechism used roughly the same format as the Lutheran Large Catechism, and also the recently issued Catholic Catechism you know, has the same outline as those prior catechisms. And we would also like to mention that St. Charles Borromeo, the ne nephew of Pope Pius IV, was a model bishop of Milan, and he was an authority in the implementation of the Council of Trent. On the positive side, the reforms of Trent led to a spiritual revival in the Catholic Church over the next few centuries. And that leads us to the history of the history of Trent, which helps explain why modern scholars view Trent as more of a reform council. The papal archives covering the Council of Trent were finally opened to serious scholars in 1880, and it took nearly a hundred years for a German publishing house to publish the archives of the council. Now from 1951 and 1975, a German scholar, Herbert J. Dean, published a four-volume history of the council. However, only two volumes have been translated into English, but Mr. J. Dean's volumes were the primary source for John O'Malley's history of the Council of Trent. And we can conclude that any history with a copyright date before the 1980s are just not accurate because they did not consult the history of the council by Herbert J. Dean, which meant that they were using uh, sources that were very slanted. And now we're going to discuss the sources. You know, first we have our favorite source, uh, John O'Malley's The Trent and What Happened at the Council. And his histories are read like novels. They're fun reading and they make you feel like you're there. They are also balanced historical accounts, both of the history and the personalities that make up this history, covering both the strengths and the weaknesses of the participants. And he's a fair historian. What brings this account to life is O'Malley's description of the politics of the various sessions and the give and take of the many debates and controversies addressed in the various sessions, which span several generations which we were not really able to get into in such a short video. In addition to the book, he has a series of lectures uh, that are now in the Catholic Learn 25 website. And these lectures use this book as a source. In my humble opinion, you would benefit most from both reading the book and listening to the lectures. Now we invested in the English uh, edition of Densinger, which includes all important church documents of both English and the original language, including the published decrees of Trent and Vatican II. And I like it because you can uh, use your yellow highlighter if you have the original. However, you don't have to buy this. If you, you can access all of these documents on the Vatican website for free. Please click on the links uh, in the description for our blog on the Council of Trent and uh, on the links for our YouTube videos on Stoic philosophy and other interesting videos that will broaden your knowledge and improve your soul. Thank you.